God frequently draws on earthly relationships to illustrate his relationship with us. He speaks in the prophet about the potter and the clay, how he is the potter and how we are like the clay that spins on the wheel and then he molds and shapes us according to his will and his plan. In both the Old and the New Testament, we see the relationship between a husband and a wife as a picture of God and his his people, a parent and a child. He is our father. We are his, his children. And so how often God will use that earthly relationship as a picture of our relationship with him and his with us. And then uh, both Old Testament and New Testament, a picture of a shepherd and his sheep. God is the shepherd. We are his, his flock. You know, before David became the king of Israel, he was a shepherd who tended his father's flock there on the heel, hills around Bethlehem. And he spent many long hours there uh, watching the flock during the daytime as they were grazing. And he began to ponder how his care for the sheep was very much like God's care for him. And so he writes this beloved psalm, Psalm 23. There are other psalms and several of the prophets that used a shepherd's care for his flock as a picture of God's care for his his people. And and it's a fitting picture because, to be blunt, sheep aren't real sharp. They really aren't. In fact, a sheep's condition is totally dependent on the quality of a shepherd. Uh, Sheep, uh, left to themselves, will wander off and get into trouble. They don't see danger for what it is, and they will just wander blindly right into it. Without a shepherd's care, they will starve to death. Sheep have been known to eat a pasture right down to the ground, and then they use their little hooves, and they dig up the roots, and they'll eat the roots, completely ruining a pasture, turning it into nothing more than a muddy field. And so the shepherd will recognize that and move the sheep to a new pasture before they they ruin the field Their welfare is completely dependent upon their shepherd. One day as Jesus is teaching, he reaches back to a passage that was well known to the people of his time. It comes from the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 23. The prophet likened the leaders of Israel to shepherds, and he rebukes them for abusing their office. Their selfish mismanagement was at that time leading to the end of the kingdom at the hand of the Babylonians who were about to come and to conquer the kingdom of Judah. Now the people of Jesus' day were familiar with that passage. Remember that many of the Jews, most of the Jews had in fact memorized what we call the Old Testament, every word of it. They didn't have chapters, they didn't have verses in those days. But they knew the text. They had memorized the entire, what they called the Tanakh, we refer to as the the Old Testament. And there were certain passages that were better known than others. And the passage in Jeremiah 23 was one of the better known passages because it was such a central part of their history as the Babylonians had come and had conquered the kingdom and hauled them away into captivity for 70 years before they could return and rebuild. And so it was a passage that was quite well known to them And the people of Jesus' day consider the leaders of Israel 500 years before, at the time of Jeremiah, to be wretched scoundrels because they had so abused their office and had so mismanaged in their task of leading the people. But as we've seen in our midweek study over the last few weeks, the leaders of Jesus' day were doing exactly the same thing in their rejection of Jesus. They were abusing their office. These ones that God had given to the nation to lead it so that they would recognize the Messiah when he came, they instead rejected him. And so now Jesus in John chapter 10 is going to speak with this passage in Jeremiah as the background for everything that he's saying. He doesn't need to quote it because he knows they already know it. Let me read to you from Jeremiah 23 that is the background for what Jesus teaches in John chapter 10. Listen to these words. Jeremiah said, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they will fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and all Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. In Hebrew, that's Yah Sidech it's a name that over time will morph into the name Yahshua. The name that we read as Jesus, the Lord, our salvation. Now, again, Jesus doesn't quote from Jeremiah because he doesn't need to. He knows that as he speaks, the people will be hearing him against the backdrop of what Jeremiah had said about the shepherds of Israel. And so he says, verse 1, John 10 most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. During the daytime, a shepherd would take his flock out to pasture. And they would spend hours each day from early morning until late afternoon with their flocks out in the fields grazing. It was a solitary life. They spent many hours alone. And so there, just picture, you have a flock of between 100 and 200 sheep grazing. The shepherd is sitting. He's watching his flock, protecting them. Is watching the field to see when it's been overgrazed. And then, you know, moving them to a new pasture. And then late every afternoon, the shepherd would take his flock to a pen that's called a sheepfold. Now, typically this is a small cave or it's a ring of stones in a field. Israel... Uh, most of the stone of, that makes up the, the land of Israel is limestone. And so it, there's a lot of caves, small caves, big caves. And uh, shepherds would use small caves as a way to store their sheep at night, protect them. If there weren't caves in the area, just big open fields, they would set this ring of stones up that's about four feet high, and then they would put bramble bushes on top of it, thorn bushes, as kind of like razor wire, if you will, for the top of this. And then what they would do is in the late afternoon, they bring their sheep into the fold, so now the sheep can be safe at night. The shepherd would sit down at the opening of the pen, of the fold, literally becoming the door, eat their evening meal, and then unroll their mat and lay down and sleep there at night. They're, they're filling the opening, thus becoming the door. That's an, uh, an idiom that Jesus is going to use in just a moment for, for his role as, as the door of the sheep. Now, <laughs> life of a shepherd's lonely. They spend hours every day by themselves. And what they would do is they would agree, hey, hey listen, uh, when we... Uh, at come to the end of our day, instead of just going to a small cave or a small pen and just having one flock there, uh, let's shepherds get together and we'll have three, four shepherds and three, four flocks and we'll put them in one larger pen or one larger cave and then we can have some fellowship at night. We can, we can talk, we can play games. And, and, and so they would do that. They would say, okay, listen, we're all going to spread to our different pastures during the day, but this afternoon, let's meet at this pen or that pen, and they had the pens named. And so late afternoon comes, you know, and you can see the flocks converging on this one pen, and the sheep would be ushered in, and then the shepherds would sit down at the door. They'd share their meal. They would talk. Oh, and if there's a city nearby, a town, a village nearby, uh, what they would do is they would say, okay, listen, um, one of us will stay here and watch the sheep. The rest can go into town, uh, you know, get something to eat, uh, go in and converse with other people, see if maybe we can find a wife. And so they would draw straws. And whoever got the short straw, I uh, have to stay behind and watch the sheep. And then the next morning, 
uh, the shepherds would come back because it's time to lead your sheep out of the pen again and take them back to pasture. And so that sets us up for verse 2. Jesus says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Sheep develop a strong attachment to their shepherd. Because they spend so much time with him during the day, they get to know his voice, and they can single his voice out from others. Quite frankly, if they hear a stranger's voice, sheep will oftentimes move away from that voice while they move towards the voice of their shepherd. In the morning, when it was time to leave the pen, the shepherd would stand as a little bit of a difference that one shepherd that had stayed behind, would now open, oh, this is shepherd, I know him. Some of these sheep are his. Now, how is that shepherd going to separate his sheep from all the sheep that have gathered? Well, he stands out at a distance, and he begins to call out his sheep. He's named them, by the way. He's gotten to know them, and he typically would name his sheep by some characteristic. Hey, Spotty, come here. And the sheep would hear their, their master's voice and they'd hear their name. They would get to know their name. And so spot here would come would be spot. Hey, stubborn, come here. Stubborn would come out, you know. Hey, uh, you know, single-toed, come here. And single-toed would come out. Shepherds also, uh, to entertain themselves, had little musical instruments that they would practice during the day. So a little whistle or a pipe or a flute. David, what was David's instrument? It was a little hand harp called a lyre. And, and so the sheep, you see, they get to know their shepherd's voice, the, his instrument, the unique songs that he would sing. Uh, they would get in tune with the tone of his voice as well. Listen, if it's in, they're in a dangerous area or maybe a wolf begins to appear on the, the hill over here, the, the shepherd's voice is, oh, sheep, pay, and, and oh, listen, it's time to be warned. You know, they'd say, oh, uh, sometimes he would say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. Because some stranger would appear on a hillside and the shepherd would say, it's okay, sheep, it's okay. And they would be calmed by his voice, warned by his voice. They knew his instrument. And so they would then come out of the pen and they would go with him and he would lead them to pasture. Now I want you to look at verse four again. When he brings out his own sheep, he goes what? Say it loud. He goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The shepherd leads his flock. He, do, flock. he doesn't drive them. He goes in front. He doesn't come behind. And the sheep follow because they trust their shepherd. They know his voice. Please hear this. Good leaders lead the way. They lead the way. They become examples to their flock. Beware the leader who drives people through fear, threats, guilt, intimidation. Beware that leader. Beware the leader that appeals to our base instincts like greed, envy, hatred. There are many voices clamoring for attention today. Many voices in the media politicians, even religious leaders. We must listen to the voice of our shepherd. Don't follow the clever voice, the one that tickles your ear. Don't listen to nor heed the funny voice that can make you laugh. I love podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts, some for information, uh, some you know, current events, what's happening in the world, uh, history. I love history, as you all know. I, I love listening to history podcasts. But I also like listening to podcasts of great preaching because I want to be a better teacher and preacher. And so I'm always trying to grow and become more proficient at that. And I'll listen to, you know, the reports that I read about on the internet about, oh, this guy's really good, and a church that is really exploding, and, and, and I'll listen, 
And there's some great preaching out there <coughs> that I benefited greatly from. But I have to say, some, sometimes you'll hear a name of someone, and I'll listen to them, and you know what? They're a polished speaker, and they're funny. And they can tell a great story. And after 45 minutes of <gasps> and laughing, I realize, but I haven't really learned anything. Hey, it's been very entertaining, but you know what? I haven't been edified. I haven't really been taught God's word. I haven't learned anything more about God or his care for me and his people. Beware the funny voice. It can make you laugh. They can tell a great story, but at the end of the day, they haven't really said anything. Hey, be careful of the appealing voice that makes fanciful promises and ignore the merely loud voice. Instead, we must listen to our master Jesus' voice. And Christian, if you've been born again, and if, by the way, if you're a Christian, you have been born again, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. And may I say, if the Holy Spirit is indwelling you, the Lord is speaking to you. Jesus is called the Word of God. It's his nature to constantly reveal himself. If you're not hearing God, it's not because he's not speaking, it's because you're not listening. The Holy Spirit is always guiding us, always seeking to speak to us. And here's the thing, I wish I had more time to go into this. We simply don't this morning. Sometime I will elaborate on this, but let me just state it very simply. Here's how you can know the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, because you hear it here, not here. This is where the Spirit speaks to us. And, and oftentimes, Christian, you know what I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit will be speaking to you, and you're, you'll, hear, you'll hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you here, and there's another voice up here, and they're arguing with each other. This is the flesh. This is the Spirit. This is the world. This is God. So listen to the Holy Spirit's voice. Listen to the voice of our Lord. And if you're not a Christian, become one. Because it's only God that wants you to flourish and thrive. The other voices want to lead to your ruin. I encourage you, become a believer today. Now, verse 6. Jesus used this illustration because, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Why? Well, because they weren't his sheep, right? The sheep hear the master's voice and why didn't they understand? Because quite frankly, they weren't his sheep, but he wanted them to be. And so he explains, verse 7, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. When the shepherd sat at the opening to the fold, he became the door. Using the well-known analogy of Israel as God's flock, Jesus makes a remarkable claim that he decides who's in and out of God's flock. Now, here's why this was so shocking to the people he's speaking to. He's speaking to a bunch of Jews that assume that simply because they are the descendants of Abraham, they're already in God's flock. And he says to them, no, what makes you a part of God's flock is not that you're a descendant of Abraham. What decides if you're uh, in God's flock or not is what you believe about me. I decide who's in and who's out. Now, this was, was shocking to them, but it was true. In verse 8, Jesus gives a nod to the parade of pretenders who over the previous couple centuries had claimed to be the Messiah. History tells us that there were well over a dozen false messiahs that had risen up over the 150, 200 years right before the time of Jesus. And they had come and they had claimed that to be the Messiah and they had been received because the people were so eager for him to come. And they meet, would make a little splash for a while. And what would happen is they, they'd raise a little group of supporters and then they would run after some Roman outpost and they would defeat the Romans, a small little group of them. But if you know anything about the Romans, you know, beat them today, they're going to be back tomorrow. 
And this is what happened again and again and again with these false messiahs. They had a quick victory. They made a quick splash. And then the Romans came back and every time put them down. And here's the problem. Every time the Romans put down one of these new insurrections, they put new limitations and restrictions on all of Israel. They raised the taxes. They brought in even more troops to station them in Israel. And they began revoking some of the rights that Israel had. As a result, the leaders of Israel had become gun shy at anybody that claimed to be Messiah. See, so the Romans were saying, you people need to police yourselves. If you won't take care of the troublemakers, we'll cause you trouble. And so by the time we get to Jesus, the leaders are in a preset default mode of rejecting anybody who claims to be Messiah. Now here's the deal. Jesus didn't really claim to be Messiah so much as he proved to be Messiah. He was. They made the mistake of automatically opposing him, and he was. And what happened then can in fact be happening now. Most of us in this room have come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's why we're here today. We've surrendered to Christ. We've put our trust in him. But chances are there is someone here, somebody watching on Facebook, who's not a Christian because they've been burned. Christians, people who call themselves the followers of Christ, don't act like him. They attended a church for a time that blew up. A pastor that they had come to respect messed up. And as a result of that, they've not surrendered to Jesus Christ because, well, they're not a Christian because of Christians. Here's the thing. These leaders rejected Jesus, but he was in fact Messiah. And folks, he still is. He still is. He's still the Savior. Don't let the lies keep you from the truth. I, I want to apologize to anyone here or anyone watching who's not a follower of Jesus because of Christians. I, I apologize for the way that we have misrepresented our Savior. Don't make the mistake of rejecting the gospel because not everybody lives up to the claims of Christ. By the way, just as there are a lot of people that are hypocrites, there are a lot of followers of Jesus that are nailing it, that are, that are actually demonstrating the change the Holy Spirit makes in a remarkable way. But I, I would encourage you today to consider the claims of Jesus because he still is the Messiah. He still is the Savior. And we invite you to, to come to him today. And by the way, the moment that you are born again, you're not going to be perfect either. Come join a bunch of imperfect people on the way to perfection. Verse 10, the thief, Jesus says, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The shepherd wants his flock to thrive. He wants them to flourish. Anyone else that comes at the flock wants to rip them off. He wants to take from them, not give to them. The shepherd leads, feeds, and protects the flock. The thief steals, kills, and destroys. I, I want to encourage you to remember that next time the strange voice calls. Because behind the smooth words is a mouth waiting to devour. Please hear this. When you are tempted to sin... You need to understand that, that Satan does not want to bless you. He wants to destroy you because he hates you. You bear the image of God. You are the focus of God's love. And he hates God, and so he hates whatever God loves. And he tempts you so that he can hook you and reel you in and then skin you. Those up front can see this. Those of you in back, let me explain. That's a hook with a worm on it. 
And this is what temptation is. In fact, one day we'll realize it's pretty wormy. But to a fish, that looks pretty good. Mmm, yummy worm. And the worm bites, only to find that there's a hook in there. That's what temptation is. Satan wants to destroy you. He does not want your best. It looks enticing, but it's death. God wants you to flourish. He wants you to thrive. So he gives you his word, his counsel, the one that made you and knows how life works. That's what this is, the manufacturer's handbook, the owner's manual. God wants you to thrive. His commands are for your blessing, for your benefit. This is the path of life. This is the path of death. So listen to the voice of your shepherd Don't go by the hook, go by the crook. (laughs) By hook or by crook. God wants us to flourish. Satan wants us to languish. Please remember that next time you're tempted, next time that voice comes. Jesus ends by making clear that he's the one that the prophet Jeremiah spoke of and promised would come when he says in verse 11, let's end with this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Hey, does the, does the thief give his life? No, he takes lives. How, how do we know the good shepherd? Because they serve, they lay down their life. They give their life. Jesus says he's the good shepherd, not just a good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's laying claim to the promise from Jeremiah. He becomes our salvation and righteousness by giving his life. And we can flourish because of his resurrection in which he gives us his life. At the end of second service today, we ordained Jordan the young man that led us in worship today. He's our, our, uh, has been our high school director. But today we recognize God's call on Jordan to be a pastor here at Calvary Chapel of Oxnard. And so uh, he had told his family and about 30 of his family and friends came out today. Uh, his wife is the pastor of another church in town. He was here today and we brought the elders and pastors and, and uh, his father-in-law came up and we laid hands on Jordan and we prayed for him. We put this staff in his hand and we put these also, one in his hand, one under his arm, uh, the sword and the word of God because the pastor's task is to lead, feed, and protect the flock of God. And we laid hands on Jordan, and we didn't didn't make him a pastor. God and God alone makes pastors. But we recognized God's call on Jordan to lead, feed, and protect the flock of God. Uh, Listen, God has made this promise. As we have the good shepherd, he also provides under shepherds for the flock. And I want to encourage you as we end today and go back into a time of worship, evaluate your leaders through the lens of the good shepherd, the one who gives his life for the flock. Evaluate those that are leaders in your life. In politics, in the church, in the home, at work, evaluate the quality of leader as they reflect our good shepherd, the one who gives his life for the flock. I want to exhort the men in this church right now. God has called you to be the leader of your home. God has called you to be like Jesus to your wife and to your kids. You love them. You serve them. You lay down your life. They do not exist for you. You exist for them. You lead them by serving them, by loving them, by laying down your life that they can live. And remember, it's not about you. It's about him. It's about him.
Now, I, I realize what I just shared is really politically incorrect, and I don't give a rip. Because I don't care about being politically correct. I, I only care about being kingdom correct, and I believe that that's what you want for your church and from your pastor. If men would be men as God intends them to be, most of the problems in our world today would disappear overnight. Men, discover what God has created you to be as a man of God. Be that and watch the blessing that will flow on everyone in your life. And here's the deal. I know almost every lady in this place is like, preach it, pastor. <laughs> right, ladies? Ladies? 